the fire exit in case of emergency, please use the door to your right, down those yes. stairs. Um, Michael Grant, are you happy with that? Well, it's uh, the only way out. <laughs> 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 out it's a great honour to to in, um, welcome George Hook to our club this evening. Um, hopefully, we will now that George has discovered where we live. He'll be a regular visitor here. Maybe we would. We, we certainly welcome that George. See a little bit more of you anyway. Um, it's just I, I'm, I'm terribly excited to hear what George and, and David are going to have to say about this book. Mm. It's 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 just a tremendous it's a tremendous undertaking to write about one's parents. I do believe that is an absolutely tremendous undertaking. And I was just thinking today about an occasion when I was in Doki and Carlo Gebler was talking about the book Father and I that he had written about his father. And it's a, it's a fascinating book, it's fabulous, very, very witty. But there were a lot of people in Kalini who felt they knew his father an awful lot better than Carlo did. <laughs> <laughs> and there was very simple, severe objections to the book. So um, I said to him, you have a brother, how does he feel about the book? Oh, he had a completely different father than I had. <laughs> <laughs> so I give you George Hood. <laughs> Madam Honorary Secretary, members of the Arts Club, uh, distinguished guests, uh, undistinguished guests, <laughs> extinguished guests, <laughs> uh, supporters of uh, the Fianna Fáil party who may well be at the wrong function tonight. Uh, now, I don't know how I got here, right? For a number of reasons I don't know how I got here, is being colorblind, I know absolutely nothing about art, Two, where I come from in Cork, uh, fellas like us didn't go to clubs like the United Arts Club or indeed <laughs> the Royal Cork Yacht Club or sundry other places. Happily in my old age I now get invited to these kind of places. Now in relation to the distinguished author tonight, although we were both in Cork around the same time, we didn't know each other. The primary reason for this was I was living with the poor Jews in Cork, and he was living with the rich Catholics. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, how this happened is quite interesting, because there's a moment in this book which has destroyed the best part of 30 years of a story I tell at lunches and dinners, and we'll come to that in just a second. But um, in Cork, if you got off the train at Cork Station tomorrow and you went to the taxi driver and you said to him, take me to Jewtown, he'd say, certainly. Now, how did this happen, all right? Jewtown is very close to City Hall and the, the, um, when the Jews, particularly as we talk about afterwards, came there from Limerick and so on, they, they went to the rabbi and they said, what the hell are we going to do? You know, we're now pretty well homeless and destitute and everything else. And the rabbi said, down there in, in Hibernian buildings, the building houses. And why did you go down there for rent? Now, these houses were interesting in that they weren't being built by the corporation. They were a private developer. But they put two up, two down, outside toilet, and no running water. I didn't see running water in the house until I was 14, and it was cold. But uh, interestingly, my nine grandchildren now have to do a rite of passage where granddad brings them to the house in the Hibernian buildings where he was born. And I have two very expensive daughters in London, and Emily, who's <laughs> 12, said to me, she said, Granddad, she said, is it really true that you had to go to the toilet in the garden? Uh, well, there wasn't any garden, I can tell you. But anyway, <laughs> it, was, it became a Jewish ghetto. 
And the Corkies, particularly politically incorrectly, immediately christened it Jewtown. And it remains Jewtown to this very day. I'm not sure there are any Jews left. But um, the, the, the story as it evolves in this book, um, of course, the, the first school in Cork, and I'm very proud of this, to accept Jewish boys was Presentation College Cork. And, and David's father went to Presentation College Cork as a Jew, when Jew, no other Jew, could, could, there was no other Catholic school in Cork who would, would take a Jew. Some years later, um, the, the, uh, the other major fee-paying school, Christian Brothers College, took Jews, and the young Goldbergs went there. For some reason, I'm not really clear about, but uh, John, the eldest Goldberg, in fact, played with Tommy Kiernan, uh, in the Munster Schools team and, and played for Christians and I remember him well even though I was a little bit behind him. So therefore I think I am eminently suitable to launch this book <laughs> given that I live closer to more Jews than David Goldberg ever did. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, I played rugby obviously and I, but I also played cricket and uh, because they had a shortage in numbers, the Jews in Dublin had a better chance of being a cricket team, i.e. 11, than they had a rugby team, uh, 15. They also, in my view, lacked a certain amount of intestinal fortitude, uh, which didn't make them very good rugby players. But I played against this fella every year. And I was a very bad runner between the wickets. And he used to run me out every time. And I, I never copped on each year that this guy was going to run me out. But we became good friends. And he said to me, he said, uh, I met him in outside Switzers. And he said, I'm the captain of the Jewish rugby team called Carlisle. Because it was a wonderful, uh, as some of you may remember, uh, it was a wonderful sports complex on the Cape Shore West, the Maccabi Sports Complex. And I coached Carlisle, the Jewish rugby team. Uh, and then in my declining years, I played with them for one season. And we played against a club, which I better remain nameless. Uh, and this fellow tackled me into the touch and he said, take that, you dirty Jew, uh, <laughs> which I was quite upset by. Uh, <laughs> so I have uh, this great tradition in this book, which we're very briefly, but it's not going to spoil it there. There are no spoilers here. But in, in Jewtown, I dined out on this story, right? Uh, we, 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 you hear in this wonderful book about the pogrom and Limerick, where the Jews were essentially driven out and they came to Cork. And then my story is as follows. A group of Lithuanian Jews walked to Latvia. And they went up to the ship's captain and they said, Captain, can you take us to America? And he said, certainly, where's that cash? So they shelled out everything they had and off they went to America. So they arrive at a harbour and he says, you're in the parish next to New York. They oh, all get no. off and they discover that they're in Cove. <laughs> so then they go up to the rabbi and they say, what the hell are we going to do, rabbi? And he says, go down there to the Hibernian buildings and they increase the population of Hibernian buildings of Jews. All right. In this book, this outstanding historian has disproved my story <laughs> and I can no longer dine out of this. <laughs> and there is no way a bunch of Lithuanians, Latvians, or otherwise, could have got to Cove because there were no boats going there. And he, he, because he's talking about his grandfather and so on, they came uh, via uh, probably the north of England or something like that. But it spoils the whole bloody story. And in fact, now that I come to think of it, I might keep telling the old story. <laughs> but I have to say, 
Um, I don't know David very long at all. As I say, he wouldn't associate with us poor Jewish fellas down in Judah. Um, but um, I, we are in press. We are doing an oral history, and we're, we're recording stories from past pupils and so on. And I wanted somebody to talk to me about the former Lord Mayor of Cork, Gerald Goldberg, who, of course, is the subject of this book, together with his wife. And a Jewish pal of mine, in fact, the captain of the rugby team, said to me, David Goldberg's your man. And I rang David, and he did a wonderful recording for me for this history, right? Yeah. And they told me about the book and everything else. And for some astonishing reason, um, he, he asked me here tonight to do this. <laughs> so I thought, sorry, ladies. Uh, SH1T. I thought, uh, you know, this isn't the biggest offer I've ever got. <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, I'm sure it's very laudable. You know, he's writing about his mum and dad. I mean, it's a very laudable thing, and everything else, but I mean, it's a what, like, you know? <laughs> but then he sent me the book. It is magnificent, right? Because it's not about his father and mother. His father and mother are like actors in this extraordinary story of Judaism in Ireland. And, and really, they're only like, and I'm not diminishing them, I'm going to come to them in a minute without giving away anything. But like the chapter on the pogrom in Limerick just is un incredible. And, they, and, and for us, like, if. My my wife worries constantly about my uh, about everything because I invariably say something that gets me into trouble. <laughs> she was wondering, would there be a Hamas supporters <laughs> outside <laughs> and the prospect of being launched in the book? <laughs> but it is interesting that this book is at a time when yet again the whole history of anti-Semitism raises its head. But in this book, it's unbelievable. That 50 years after the pogrom in Limerick, you had somebody repeating precisely the same calumnies that had been uh, repeated at the beginning of, of the century. But, but what he has done here, I mean, I thought it was a great read. I mean, I really thought this is up there with John Grisham, you know. Um, <laughs> it's a great read because... He, what he, I know he, he's a barrister, and then he decided he wanted to be a painter. But now he is a historian. Historically, this stands up. There's a great historian of World War II called Anthony Beaver that I read all the time. This is it, like, this is Ant Anthony Beaver for Jews. Because, like, he, the research, he, when you read it, you think, <laughs> You mean he got the Cork exam up in nineteen twenty five, and he actually got the info from it, or 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 whatever. And I, I don't want to give much away because I want you to read it. He is an extraordinary uh, uh, historian. Now I have to, however, I discovered that all the grammatical errors which he made, which apparently were manifold were corrected by his wife, to whom we owe a large debt of gratitude <laughs> for the grammatical correctness of this book. Um, the, 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 the other thing about it that, that is, is astonishing is his mother. Because, of course, the old man, I knew him. Remember, I'm in court to all this, you know? And, and like, Gerald Goldberg was very, he was Jewish, and he was the Lord Mayor, and he was a fan of Fowler, and, you know, all those kind of things. I mean, he was a big man in, in Cork, and he, he wasn't afraid to take on cases that many other solicitors might not have taken. So, therefore, Mrs. Goldberg, senior at that time and um, like kind of was lost in that in a way and here this book gives her the absolute unbelievable credit that she deserves sadly i didn't know her i knew i knew her husband david's father but i, I didn't know her and she comes out of this superbly 
This is a love story as well. The way he talks about his mother. And it had a resonance for me because I was an only child. My mother actually thought I was born in a stable in Bethlehem. Um, 